Tonight on KQED Newsroom, state lawmakers come one step closer to ending cash bail in California as they decide the fate of hundreds of bills. Also, going in-depth with an executive at Reddit, the popular online forum that's been called, quote, the front page of the Internet. Plus, Crazy Rich Asians, the new movie directed by a Bay Area native with an all-Asian cast, is hoping to break barriers in Hollywood and beyond. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with politics. In Sacramento, state lawmakers and Governor Jerry Brown have just two weeks to decide the fate of a thousand bills before the end of the legislative session. On Thursday, a measure that would end the practice of cash bail in California cleared a key committee. But hurdles lie ahead, including opposition from law enforcement. Also this week, President Trump revoked the security clearance of former CIA director John Brennan, who has frequently criticized the president. A dozen former security officials, including Leon Panetta, signed a letter condemning the decision, saying it was done to stifle free speech. Joining me now to discuss the week's political developments are KQD politics and government reporter Marisa Lagos, San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer Joe Garofoli, and political consultant Sean Walsh. Welcome back to all of you. It's great Thanks to be here. Us. Well, Marisa, I know you were at the state capitol covering the flurry of bills. Uh, there's been a scramble this week to decide the fate of hundreds of bills. Which ones made it through? Well, as we mentioned at the top, the bail reform bill, I think, was the biggest news of this week. This had kind of languished for the last year after um, a year of effort to get it through the legislature. Both the governor and the chief justice of the courts asked for more time, saying that they needed, to, they wanted to compromise. And what came out, I think, is uh, making everyone a little happier who wanted to see something happen, except for the bail agents, of course, who would lose their jobs <laughs> if this passed. Yeah, yeah. And um, some of the, the, I would say, civil liberties groups like the ACLU who say that it's gone too far, um, they wanted to see sort of more independence in these decisions about release. Uh, under this bill now, judges would have a lot of power to decide if somebody um, was rated low or medium mm -hmm. or high risk under the risk assessments counties would adopt, um, whether to release them. And so, you know, if you, if you were arrested yeah. under this bill and had a misdemeanor charge, you would basically get out automatically in 12 hours, which isn't actually that different than now. Um, but if you have, a, you know, a felony, um, it, it's a question. And so I think we'd see more preventative detention, but also a lot more people getting out. Yeah, some concerns there about maybe judicial bias creeping in. Right, which I think is a conversation that's important, but maybe this isn't. You know, I, if you want to get this bill through, they, yeah. they were going to have to make some compromises. Also, uh, there were three police accountabil uh, accountability measures. What happened to those? Right. So the most controversial of those would make it easier to prosecute police officers who kill a civilian. That one got sort of a weird procedural move. They pulled it out of fiscal committee where it could have died if it didn't pass, put it back in rules. It's Negotiations are ongoing. Mm -hmm. Both sides kind of claim victory. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, two others that around police records and body cameras did make it out. Mm -hmm. I think those have a much better chance politically. But the fact that that um, prosecution bill isn't dead yet, I think, says something that at least lawmakers and the governor want to be talking about this. They don't want to be seen as kind of killing it in the dark right. of night. So those are bills all hoping to become law. But then let's talk about something that has been on the law books for a long time, and that's Prop 13. This is the 40th anniversary of a Proposition 13, the measure limiting property taxes in California. Joe, now a coalition of community groups, says it has enough signatures to place a measure on the 2020 ballot that would, in effect, eliminate the tax benefit for commercial properties, residential homeowners would still have the benefit. How big is this fight likely to get? Oh, this, this will be huge. And, and the challenge for the people who are promoting this is to say, this is not about grandma's house. This is about making sure Disneyland and Chevron in, in Richmond pay their fair share. Because so many of these commercial properties have never been reassessed. And, 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 there's, and there's billions of dollars in potential tax revenue for schools and, and, and such that it's available to them, or potentially available. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a huge fight. This is like, you know, uh, uh, some of the most, one of the most powerful interests in, in Sacramento well, several is... several of them. I mean, the real estate them, industry yeah. alone is a huge, powerful yes. interest. They've yeah. really you know, run a lot of this, but once you get all these corporations involved, I mean, I think we also have to know that there's another ballot measure in November that would actually sort of expand Prop 13 for 
individual property owners, it would let you take the assessed value of your home if you bought another house in California, no matter where you moved. Um, so I think it'd be interesting if that passed to see the argument the proponents of this um, other one would make to say, right. well, you know, look, we're protecting mom and pop, yeah. but would I'm sure Sean's not on board with this at all. Look, this is, this is going to be the political Armageddon battle, yes. literally. And, you know, California's unemployment rate is out today, 4.2 percent. California's employment picture is not like it was when Prop 13 was passed 40 years ago. We do right. not have large factory employers. Most of our businesses are small businesses or medium-sized businesses. They will be disproportionately impacted by this. It's a terrible economic issue. And I think the reason why the labor unions put this out now is they were worried about the decision that just came down from the Supreme Court and how much money they'd be able to throw at this. So this is a big CTA move. It's $10 billion at least, much higher. And this is going to be a battle royale. But there will be much more friendly electorate in 2020. Than there is. Uh, I'm not sure there will be. So when you actually go out and do the numbers and you look at the mom and pop, the bagel store in Montclair or the mm -hmm. coffee shop here in San Francisco, and their rates are going to go way up, and it's going to get you passed think most on the consumers. Do most of those consumers. own their buildings, though? I mean, uh, uh, many of them do actually. So but it's also going right. to. If you have less than 50 employees, I think those folks are going to be exempted. They're trying to carve out the the, the small business guys, but that's going to be that's going to be the, the the fight right so, there. So so there will be two years out. We'll be hearing <laughs> yeah, a oh, yeah, lot more about this. 27 and, panels and about before the legacy that. of Prop yes, 13 yes, yes. and whether it, yeah. it really achieves any of the tax savings and high rates of home ownership that it was designed uh, to address. But meanwhile, let's move on to the November midterm elections because uh, we have Nancy Pelosi facing a growing challenge, really, uh, from within her own party. Several dozen Democratic candidates, many of them younger, are saying that they, um, they, they won't vote for Pelosi if they're right. elected. And then we have the third-ranking uh, House Democrat, uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn, saying that he will seek um, the speakership if Pelosi struggles to get enough votes uh, in November. Sean, where do you see this going from here? It's not been a good week for Nancy Pelosi. The New York Times had a very uh, extensive piece today about the growing revolution against her in her own caucus. A lot of young folks, uh, and also they said older folks are revolting against her. I don't know who's much older than Nancy Pelosi in her caucus. Clyburn is a ranking member. It's one of her lieutenants, and right. for him to come out and say that is really remarkable. Uh, the other thing I will note, too, is the Sacramento Bee came out this week with an editorial basically saying she should step down because it's too important in this election cycle to not have Democrats take control and that she is a tool that Republicans are using to campaign across the country. I believe that's the case. I really do. But she's having a tough week. And to her credit, she's out all over the country campaigning to raise money to change this election, take back the House. And this is the thanks she's getting from her own right. caucus. Which is, you know, I think speaks to the duality here. She is hugely unpopular, of course, not in San Francisco, where she keeps getting reelected. And, you know, you know, I think that's one thing that's important to note. The people that get to vote on this are her constituents in San Francisco and then the members in the House, not, not the country at large. But, you know, she has been an enormously successful fundraiser. She was a very effective speaker. I mean, if you talk to Obama people, they say Obamacare wouldn't have happened and a bunch of other huge initiatives. And so it is an interesting, I think, thing to see how she's trying to kind of thread this needle. But she's also, I think, speaking very differently this week than she was, say, a year ago about this. She's sort of open the path that she could potentially step down, depending on what happens. And of course, if Democrats lose, I and mean, and she's and definitely she's, out. She's and I think she softened her tone a little bit about being more open to uh, building bridges. Right. But to... her, her, problem, her problem is, her real problem right now is the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And they're really angry with her that she has not aggressively gone out and attacked the president for what the LeBron James issues and Maxine Waters and what they feel is the president's racist issues. And they want Jim Clyburn, who's and African American. So per perhaps they do. He's, he's not the future for that party. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's 76 not. 76 years old or something like that, too. I mean, he's not definitely not the future. Uh, Pelosi mm -hmm. is, is going to be hearing it more and more. The, the uh, Republicans are going to start launching these uh, Pelosi ads. She stars in like one and a out of every four Republican yeah. House ads in California in the next couple of weeks. So she's going to be facing this. The, the pressure is just going to be turning up for her. And also on the national front, a dozen former senior intelligence uh, officials have signed a letter now uh, basically supporting former CIA Director John Brennan. They're calling President Trump's decision to strip him of his security clearance uh, basically a, poli a political move to uh, stifle free speech. Sean, does the president's action amount to an unconstitutional abuse of power? Well, it's clearly not unconstitutional. He is the executive executive authority to decide who has security clearances or not. Uh, some people think it's a brushback pitch 
against people in his current national security regime to say, if you talk, and if you talk to these people and they come out and talk against us, we'll go after you. So I think it is an intimidation tactic on the president's part. You know, the security clearance, he doesn't have top secret right. SCI clearance anymore. It's just secret clearance, so he can communicate with other people about issues. He but can be consulted with. He can, but, you know, yeah, Brennan's consult. not doing himself any favors either. It looks like Dennis the Menace, Mr. Wilson, he's a grumpy old guy yelling at another grumpy old guy. <laughs> so I, um, I'm not sure he's being as sympathetic as he is the the smart part was Mike Morrell and the rest of the intelligence community people doing the letter. One of my friends and former colleague has helped to marshal that issue. So it, it hurts the president in in many respects, but by normal. Uh, moderately thinking Americans. And I think even some of those who uh, officials who signed the letter did express a level of discomfort with just how <clears throat> harsh um, some of Brennan's comments have been against President Trump. And Brennan kind of has it, uh, trying to have it both ways. He says, he makes these illusions that, uh, oh, you know, he, he's uh, Trump is a uh, yeah. puppet of Putin. But then he, when he was asked point blank, do you know? Of, of any compromising material that he has. And Brennan said, no, I don't. Mm. So, okay. and, and he would know as the, supposedly right. as the head of the CIA. We have to leave it there. Uh, Joe Garofoli with the San Francisco Chronicle, Sean Walsh, political consultant, and Marisa Lacos of KQED. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Moving now to tech, imagine a free website where you can find more than 100,000 discussion forums on pretty much any topic imaginable. Welcome to Reddit. Since its launch in 2005, Reddit has become the fourth most popular website in the U.S. Each month, hundreds of millions of visitors comment on and post links to various topics known as subreddits. But with that growth comes challenges. Like Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, Reddit is grappling with how to protect free speech while fighting hate speech and online bullying. Here now to talk about all of this is the general counsel and vice president of Reddit, Melissa Tidwell. Melissa, nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. So Reddit is one of the most popular websites, mm -hmm. not only in the U.S., but in the world. Uh, yet it doesn't have the same name recognition as, say, YouTube or Facebook. Why do you think that is? You know, I think it's a couple of things. Um, when I started the company in 2015, um, we were about 60 people, and now we're about three, about 400. And so That's I think hyper growth. It's, a, it's a lot of growth, but you know, in comparison to sort of our, our user growth, it's a, we're an incredibly small company. So I think a lot of the things that we've tried to focus on is kind of building out the core functions that we need in order to sort of grow and, and really manage the platform the way that we want to. Um, and also, I think it's just the nature of Reddit, right? It's a very, it's, it's a collection of communities that, as you said, are interested in a wide variety of topics. And so in terms of that, um, in terms of users sort of being out there and the brand perception, some users want to, you know, are, are doing interesting things for the, for the world, and some users want to maintain their privacy and have that. And as you've grown, you've had similar growing pains to other companies, such mm -hmm. as um, Facebook and Twitter. And, and that is the issue of how do you moderate for um, hate speech online? It's been a tricky issue. Um, how do you balance Reddit users' right to free speech while mm -hmm. monitoring and even shutting down hate speech? Yeah, I mean, you're raising, all the, I think we're having a great conversation today on those questions. Um, I think for Reddit, we are focusing on a couple of things. As I said, part of our growth is growing the company and growing the functions that we need to have for the company to be successful. So for us, that means we have a, an actual policy team now that thinks about these things from a big picture perspective. We have a trust and safety team, which are the enforcers, and that ensure that as we have policies, they can enforce at scale. We have the anti-evil engineering team, which are <laughs> That's the, what the team called, anti -evil engineering team. <laughs> current name. Um, and so, you know, the team that they're they are help us build the tools, right? So I have a partner in Chris Slow, who's our CTO, and we sit next to each other and we talk about as we're thinking about policy issues, he's thinking about the technological solutions of how do we help it, how do we scale it when we have that number of users. Do you have actual human beings who are reviewing these things and flagging them as Facebook has is doing? Yeah, well the Reddit model is a little bit different, right? So for us we have what we like to talk about as a federated system. So we have Reddit Inc. and we have the trust and safety team who um, enforces our content policy. We also have a community moderator team. They actually go into the communities, work with the moderators, ensure that they are growing healthy communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we have the moderators themselves. So as you mentioned, we have over 100,000 communities. Each of those communities are moderated and they have their own additional rules. Okay. So as an example, you know, there are communities um, 
about cats. And sometimes you can only talk about cats. Mm -hmm. If you post a picture of a dog, they will enforce that so rule. So they kind of self-censor. So they, on each community has their own different rules of what they want in that community. And, and speaking of yeah. rules and potential censorship, this week t uh, Twitter tempor mm -hmm. temporarily suspended Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. He's the founder of the far-right um, news site Infowars. Mm -hmm. But some critics have argued that Twitter really should have gone further and ban Infowars and Alex Jones outright as Facebook and Apple and other companies have done. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? You know, I don't, I don't know the different policies um, always at each of the companies, and I think, you know, all of the tech companies are kind of struggling with where we are in the world today and kind of some of the things that have happened. You know, for us, we're really focused. Infowars hasn't been on our site, you know, for a number of years. Um, and why is that? They just took themselves off or you shut them um, down? That we had a soft ban on the, on the domain for people using it for spam and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a prevalent website on our, on our, on our community. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, what's important for us is that we all take a step back, think about the policy that you want to have as a company. All of the companies are different, have different goals, um, and ensure that we can enforce them, right? I think a lot of the, the pushback is that the public doesn't understand kind of what the policies are and how do you enforce mm -hmm. them and why they are what they are. And so we have a different model. We communicate with our, with our users a lot. Um, in our post about why we're changing policies, what that means for them, and, and communities can go even further than what we've prescribed. Let's talk about online bullying. How mm -hmm. big of a problem is that on Reddit, and how do you fight that? Um, you know, it's a great question. We a lot focus on sort of the behaviors of the users that we think add to this, right? So one of the things that I did when, we, um, when I came to the company in 2015 um, was to start to look at some of the policies that we had, and, and did they go far enough as we talked about harassment and things of that nature. And over the course of you know three years, we've iterated on a lot of our policies to get to some of that behaviors to ensure that as we're seeing what's happening on our site, that we're thinking through, is this, you know, is this harassment? Is this not harassment? How to what happens when it's bilateral versus unilateral? Asking a lot of those hard questions and then making your own decisions. So I think the site has actually come a long way mm -hmm. in terms of how it tolerates harassment and getting on top of it. A lot of what the trust and safety team does is when they have those rules, they can build mechanisms of which they can get some of this at scale. So we're not waiting for one-to-one -one reporting mm -hmm. for somebody to say, this has happened to me, it's a problem. We are more actively looking for on the site those interactions to make sure that they're not happening. Uh, let's talk about Silicon Valley's diversity gap as mm -hmm. well. Uh, prior to Reddit, you spent eight years as an attorney at Google, mm -hmm. so you've been able to so, sort of break through the ranks, but you're a rarity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, studies show, government figures show that that in tech companies, the executive level is 84 percent uh, white. It's mm -hmm. nearly 70 percent um, uh, men. Mm -hmm. What can you do to change that and move more women and people of color into positions of tech leadership? You know, I, it's a it's a definitely a problem in tech, and I think tech is starting to realize that. Um, as a black female um, executive you know, one of the, the very few, I think a couple of things are, are really important. Number one, it's important that you have the conversation at the executive level. So, um, you know, I came, I started the company, Steve Huffman is our CEO, came I think probably a month or two after I did. Um, and it's a conversation that I've had, we've had a very open and honest conversation about diversity and the importance of it. Um, so and what do I you do about it? It's, you have to acknowledge the issue and you take steps to address it. I think for us as an executive team, our executive team reflects diversity and therefore our reports reflect diversity. It's not shocking that as a, as a minority executive, I then have three out of four women who are my leads. Um, it's not shocking that um, the diversity of my own team is much more intuitive because I'm looking for different things. I'm looking for different perspectives. And we try and talk about that as a company as to how other teams can sort of think differently. That's not, you can't just search on LinkedIn. You can't just look for, I need someone who's exactly done this at this type of company. Yeah. You have to think outside the box and do it in different ways. And so mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a problem that's never ending and something that you just have to continually work at. One step at a time. Yeah. Melissa Tidwell, General Counsel at Reddit, thank you for being with us. Thank you. We turn our attention now to Hollywood and race. On Wednesday, Crazy Rich Asians opened in theaters across the nation. The romantic comedy is based on the best-selling novel by Kevin Kwan. The story revolves around Rachel, a New York economics professor. She discovers that her boyfriend, Nick, hails from the richest family in Singapore. So your family is, like, rich? Um, we're comfortable. 
That is exactly what a super rich person would say. But this is not your typical Hollywood romantic comedy. Crazy Rich Asians is the first major studio film released in 25 years to feature an all-Asian cast drawn from around the world. It's also sparked debates over race and representation in Hollywood. Here now with a closer look are Valerie So, a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. And joining us via Skype from Los Angeles is Korean American blogger Phil Yu. Welcome to you both. Well, Valerie, this movie touches on some very familiar romantic comedy themes. A woman from a modest background falls in love with a man who is rich. They have some hurdles along the way, but they end up together all in two hours. But in many ways, the movie is also considered very groundbreaking. How so? You know, it's a typical romantic comedy, but it's got an Asian American lead actor and actress who are involved with each other. So to have um, a couple as Asian American is, is pretty rare in Hollywood movies, you know, both of the lead characters. And also how to have an Asian man as a romantic lead is even more rare. So, plus it's also directed by an Asian American director. And, and Phil, in what ways do you find the movie groundbreaking? You know, the story's as old as stories have been told, right? But the, the fact that it's top to bottom, wall to wall, all Asians, um, and told in a very specific way, you know, um, and told with, with cues and, and little hallmarks that are like very specific to our community, it makes it really special to see that reflected on screen, you know? And, and you've seen the movie five times, and, and there was a real... Six, six times. Oh, six times. <laughs> well, thank you for the correction. And, and you know, I've heard the director talk about this movie, and he made a real effort here to cast the net wide. I mean, these are Asian actors and actresses that came from all over the world, London, the U.S., uh, Britain, Australia, Malaysia. And to see that kind of representation on screen, how did you feel, and, and what did you think of the movie? It's just rare when you get to see a movie like this, right? And um, and it's not for lack of talent, right? There, there are so many really talented performers across the globe, in this country, in Hollywood, who just never get a shot and get a story like this. To, so to see them really, they, they pick, the casting is probably the strongest thing about the movie. And to see them go and fire all, on all cylinders and really just show their stuff, it makes for a really entertaining product. And that gets to uh, something else I want to talk about, which is Hollywood has gotten increasing criticism for a practice called whitewashing, mm -hmm. casting white actors in roles that were envisioned um, as Asians. For right. example, Chilo Swinton was selected for the role of the Asian man, the Ancient One, in Doctor Strange. Emma Stone played a part Asian uh, woman in the movie Aloha. How much influence do you think this movie, Crazy Rich Asians, will have on future casting decisions in Hollywood? You know, I think it's huge because part of the catch-22 of Asian American actors not getting lead roles is they, as that producers, Hollywood will say, there are no Asian actors who can open a film, who are fa famous enough to open a film. But if you never cast Asian actors, then they're, how are they ever going to get famous enough? So uh, Constance Wu's got some buzz from Fresh Off the Boat, of course. She and plays the female romantic lead. She is so charming in this movie. She is so <laughs> cute, and you just want to squeeze her, right? <laughs> well, there, there was a USC Annenberg um, initiative study that showed that only 5% of the characters with speaking roles in the top 100 films last year were Asian. What do you think about that statistic? That's a pretty low statistic. I mean, 5% of the speaking roles, that's pretty low, especially since Asian Americans are 5% of the population in the U.S., so we should have more lead roles, not just the guy who brings the delivery food, mm. you know, or and the nail salon lady. Yeah, and, and Phil, there's a local connection here as well. The director, John Chu, uh, is from Palo Alto. His father, Lawrence Chu, owns um, the famous Chef Chu's restaurant in Los Altos. A lot of celebrities have been there over the years. Uh, do, do you think the movie does an adequate job of depicting the nuances of the Asian experience, you know, Asian American versus those who live in Asia? And, and the two groups don't always necessarily identify with one another. Well, first of all, it's impossible for any one film to capture sort of the diversity of our community, which is, you know, there are so many nuances, right? So, but I think the film does a really admirable job of capturing that dynamic of an Asian American person going to Asia and really understanding, like, feeling like a fish out of water, right? Like, I think a lot of us can relate to that, like, not Asian enough when you go to Asia. And 
made to feel not American enough when you're here. Uh, Phil, there are also some detractors for this movie uh, who contend the movie's darker-skinned Asian characters are mostly guards or domestic workers in the movie, that the film also focuses on Singapore's dominant Chinese majority and really perpetuates the underrepresentation of ethnic Asian minorities. What are your feelings about that? I think those are valid concerns. I think, you know, it, it's it's definitely worthwhile to have that conversation about the way even within uh, Asian communities, you know, the diversity, whether or not that's covered or where, whether people are represented. Um, you know, but if you look at the movie, it is very specific in, in the group that it is focused on, right? The Singapore's top 1%. And so that truthfully is a, a certain class, a certain look and a certain, uh, you know, ethnicity, right? And that further highlights the point, doesn't it, that, that no one movie can represent all the groups because, you know, Asian is not a monolithic group. Koreans are different from Vietnamese, from Chinese. Uh, and it really points to the need for more stories so that more people can tell their stories. I mean, it's really unfair for one film, one romantic comedy, to shoulder the burden of all representation of all of Asians around the world, right? So I think it's best to look at this movie for what it is. Like, yes, it is important and it is revolutionary in a lot of ways in terms of representation, but it is still just one film, uh, hopefully the start of many. Are there parallels here between uh, Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther, which featured an, uh, a cast of all black actors and actresses? I think where you can draw the parallels are definitely uh, people getting excited about uh, movies that are very popular genres but are normally populated and normally led by mostly white casts. And so to see a romantic comedy, sort of one of Hollywood's most tried and true genres, and getting to see, you know, wall-to-wall -wall Asian Americans and, and having fun and falling in love and having a beautiful spectacle, I think that that is really something special and people think that people are getting excited about. And, and Valerie, there have been comparisons made to Joy Luck Club. That mm -hmm. came out 25 years ago. It did well at the box office, and yet nothing really happened. It was another 25 years before another movie, this time, Crazy Rich Asians, with an all-Asian mm -hmm. uh, cast. Um, has much change, do you think, it can lead to future changes in Hollywood? For sure. I mean, I think part of it is, like I said, the demographics. There's so many more Asian Americans now living in this country than there even were 25 years ago. But I think also Asian American filmmakers themselves have been pushing this for a long time. There's tons of Asian American indie films that are incredible that have been made in that time that uh, have been slowly building audience and making people realize that, yeah, we want to see Asian American stories. On, on the screen, told by Asian Americans. And do you think the fact that there's so much buzz around this movie will help those, will help other projects in the pipeline get green lighted? You hope so, right? I mean, I think money talks in Hollywood. So I think the fact that people are lining up around the block to see this movie at movie theaters or selling out theaters is pretty, it's a pretty strong statement for a place like Hollywood, which, which is really business driven. All right, Professor Valerie So with San Francisco State University and Phil Yu, our blogger, joining us from Los Angeles. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And that will do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.